Uh, thank you, Sally. And uh, yes, I can't believe this is the last of our happy hours for, for 2023. Uh, I've lost count how many we've run, um, but uh, they've been extremely popular. And can I thank you for, for participating and joining us as a delegate and panel speaker, panelists and speakers. Um, this session, as Sally says, is happy uh, 15 years on. Um, and the session is made possible by the support of UKRI Healthy Aging Challenge uh, and their work around wanting to look at uh, living longer and healthier lives uh, for longer and living well into, into later life. And housing in a built environment is a critical part. Well, we've brought together a stellar cast for you uh, this afternoon. Um, and just reflecting on it, back in 2008, when the first happy panel was assembled 15 years ago, I was at the Department of Health and was one of the co-commissioners of that. And a lot of credit has to go to the Homes uh, and community, how homes and Communities Agency and, and Kevin McGear and the team uh, who led that project. Um, and of course, Lord Best, Richard, who was with us there and chaired that panel. And I'm delighted that you're here today to reflect on uh, the last 15 years as well and, to, and give your insights on, on things going forward, especially with things like the Older People's Housing Task Force uh, in mind. Uh, but we're going to start off with uh, Lord Best shortly, and he'll be followed by Jenny from PRP, who will then be followed by Patrick, who was one of the co-authors uh, from PTE uh, Architects, and Gary, who's been a, a long friend of the Lynn, um, also one of the original HopDev members as well. For those of you who remember Lifetime Homes, Lifetime Neighbourhoods over 15 years ago, uh, is joining us uh, from Churchill Retirement. And Gary, thanks ever so much for, for Churchill Retirement joining a family of Lynn supporters uh, today as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Richard and Lord Best, over to you. Jeremy, thank you for introducing me, but much, much more important, thank you to the Housing Lynn, which over these 15 years has been terrific in keeping the flag flying. Uh, it's all very well to produce these reports, one after the other, but usually they just gather dust. And because we've got the Housing Lynn, there has been this endless stream of engagements, uh, seminars, uh, a happy awareness week even. This has been great and, and, and we deeply appreciate what, what you've done. So it was in 2008, Bob Kerslake was then, the late Bob Kerslake, who we were very sorry to lose earlier this year. Bob was the boss of the HCA, the Homes and Communities Agency, now Homes England. And uh, he asked me if I would chair the Panel for Innovation for Supported and Sheltered Older People's Housing. The acronym was P-I-S-S-O-P-H. Piss off. No, this wouldn't do. <laughs> that was the moment that, that Happy was born because Housing Our Aging Population Panel for Innovation, it was to be. And it's, it's done us rather well. Um, year, year, year after year, we've, we've used this for the, the subtitle of uh, a series of reports. We've had rural housing uh, for an aging population panel for innovation. We've had uh, rental housing uh, for an aging population. We've had shared ownership housing for an aging population. And that one gave us so happy, which was the best of all. Uh, but each of these reports has contributed, I think, to the knowledge that we have of what is what needs to be done. Starting with the, 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 the initial 2008, came out in 2009, happy report, which did concentrate on design. And I think uh, it has been incredibly influential. We have our happy awards every year. We're seeing what, uh, what we know people need and want. Uh, and the disappointment for me is that 15 years on, we're not much further uh, in getting the numbers up, the actual volume of production of new homes for people in uh, later life than we were back then in 2008. We haven't really progressed. We know what we want now, and because the design is so good, it's an exemplar for the rest of the, the housing sector, both the, the social housing sector and the private housing se sector but we're not getting the numbers. And what I think we discovered, we went to seven countries in the, in the, the, the happy uh, expeditions around uh, Europe. Uh, and we saw how in other countries, people responded to that good design, uh, beautiful proportions, uh, good to look at, 
always with those communal spaces, the hub, the club room, the place where people could meet, where we could have co-living, co-housing concepts. All of this worked so well on the continent. What we didn't really understand, and what I think we're still failing to grapple with, is the cultural barrier in the UK. We don't want to move. We just don't want to do it. And it's it goes against the grain in this country for people to move in older age, even though it financially it would be so much better to downsize, to right size. Uh, physically, it would be so much better for our health, for our well-being, curing those problems of loneliness and isolation. There's so much going for a move to somewhere more suitable, an extra care scheme, a retirement housing scheme, an integrated retirement scheme. And we know from happy one onwards, we know what it looks like. We know what really works, but we're not doing it. And we, we still resist the, the opportunities that do exist. And I hope we can explore some of those today uh, and perhaps at the end, end on a slightly more optimistic note for the future. But Jeremy, let me hand back to you for, for the presentations. Well, uh, and thank you, uh, Richard, for, for that uh, introduction. And as you say, a really sad loss to the sector with uh, uh, Lord Kerslake uh, this year. Um, but we're going to kick off with Jenny. Uh, Jenny uh, has worked very at PRP for, for many a year, uh, but also as part of the team behind the scenes with Roger Battersby, uh, who obviously was on the original panel as well. So, uh, Jenny, over to you, because uh, PRP got a long tradition uh, supporting Happy, but also offering the thought leadership around this as well. You're muted. Right, I think I'm on with it. I think you can see my screen, hopefully. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as I said, um, my name is Jenny Woodsacky. I'm a partner at PRP and I'm an architect. And we've got a team at PRP that um, have got over 40 architectural and landscape designers who work solely in the sector of labour living. And we've managed to build over 12,000 units um, since we started, which is a, a really great experience and great portfolio, but we're always learning more. Um, and Lord Best mentioned um, the Happy Awards. We've been very fortunate to have won uh, 13 of the Happy Awards since they first started, and we've had another 25 shortlisted. And you will see some of the images in this um, from those winning schemes to be like throughout my presentation today. But I'm going to just reflect a little bit on the Happy Recommendations, and then I'm going to look at one of the winners from this year, um, New Lodge Community, which was finished uh, just over a year ago, and then a few thoughts um, beyond Happy. So the um, panel started in two, 2008, and um, Roger Battersby from PRP, as mentioned, was, was on that panel. And out of that panel came 10 recommendations, which were really design orientated. And I just wanted to briefly remind us what they are, um, and just also share a few images from a few projects and how they can potentially be achieved. So the first one of those was looking at generous, flexible space standards. These flat plans are from the housing and fact sheet, which we wrote um, design guidance for extra care. Um, and shows sort of generous one beds and generous two beds. The second one was really thinking about natural light, and that's not just into dwellings, but also into circulation spaces where possible. Number three was about where possible to, to, to minimize uh, internal corridors and avoid single aspect dwellings. And you can see here in Pilgrim Gardens how that's achieved with gallery access overlooking the beautiful communal garden areas. The fourth one was about care ready. These are age and place cottages in Oakley. They are easy adaptable homes and, and they actually are all technology enabled, which was a key feature of, of recommendation four. Number five was thinking about the circulation spaces. These give uh, us a positive way for people to interact, one meet, meet, neighbour meeting another, and not just to be long uh, dark corridor spaces. Number six was thinking about those really important community spaces make sure they're well-designed, linked uh, to the wider community, such as this community cafe at Arden Quarter, and make sure they're really sociable spaces for people to live in. Number seven was the public realm, how homes can positively engage with the street and the wider community and not forget the la natural landscape in that too. And number eight was thinking about energy efficient buildings, climate resilience uh, developments, 
Um, and we're seeing more and more the drive towards net zero on projects now. Nine, finally, this, uh, I was thinking about storage inside and outside of the home. Um, and I think, you know, just to remember when you're building apartments, that even these little spaces um, off, off the balconies are actually really important to be able to put your pots in. And then finally, it was thinking about beyond the home, what are the barriers that can stop somebody from going out when they're in the later years? And home zones is a really good design principle that puts people absolutely in priority over cars, so really important. So just then to look at New Lodge, um, which is a, a retirement village in uh, New Yearswick, uh, which for, for Joseph Browntree. And um, the original uh, site, which you can see on the left, was actually before, um, was a, a, a Unwin and Parker Garden Village. And it was designed um, with a series of uh, folk, focal points for the community, including a folk hall, which grade two listed a swimming pool, kids playground, and Red Lodge, the top was a, was a care home. But there was loads of routes that you can see the black and the red arrows, loads of routes through that site where people would uh, cut across it. But over time, it had become a little bit tired. And Joseph Grantry had also identified that there was a real opportunity because there was a change in demographics um, in the whole area. Because there was nowhere for older people to move into, it meant that the whole community was aging and there were no new families moving in. So the vision for this was to not just reprovide the care home, but was actually to think beyond that, to think about recreating that inclusive and sustainable Intergener intergenerational uh, neighbourhood. And the master plan actually has quite a permeable layout, which provides new built uh, care home uh, plus extra care housing. And it was aimed very much at the residents of the widened years right, to give them somewhere they potentially might move into themselves. The idea of freeing up those family housing to revitalise the whole wider village. And by making the development um, older people's at the heart, it meant that it was property and it did become property intergenerational because everyone's encouraged to walk through it. And all the walking routes that you can see here in the connections, and um, they remain, but the public realm, the landscape and the play space have all been upgraded substantially to provide a real destination and a desirable place for the whole village to come to. The white building you can see on the right hand side is the grade two folk hall, and that's been also regenerated as a community hub, which includes um, various community spaces and a little crash. But rather than one big building, the scheme has been designed to have a series of individual buildings and um, all around this beautiful public realm. And you can see here the site permeability, those routes coming through, people walking to central gardens into the area beyond. And the residential accommodation is a series of smaller blocks. It's about maximizing the daylight and ventilation into those. And the housing not only overlooks those streets and walking routes, but it has these lovely little intimate garden spaces between them and the idea of creating a little community within the wider community. The care home uh, itself, as you can see, it looks exactly the same as the housing. And um, there's a canvas the architecture and the master plan. And these covered routes that run through the site, they link the care home back to the folk hall. And that's for operational reasons, but it's also actually for practicality reasons. So staff can get food to to and from and residents can come across to the folk hall in the rainy days. But it has been designed very much thinking about adaptability and flexibility. So you can see here three number of care beds fits in the same footprint as a two-bed apartment, and they have been built in such a way that one could be converted to the other or vice versa, depending on what the future needs might be of the, the development and the residents within it. And you can see here the semi-private garden that leads up to the front entrance of the care home, and that's around that there's a mixture of extra care and the care home, and it's become this lovely popular place to sit in the morning and um, to get to catch the sun, and it encourages the residents to, to mix the same two developments. We worked very closely with our sustainability consultants and we looked uh, at climate resilience for this, looking at 2030 into 2050. And the one key thing that came out of all the initial analysis was the potential for overheating on these uh, rooms in the roof on the upper floors. They were important, they were designed like that for planning reasons, um, but they were actually um, one of the issues to do with overheating. So as a result of that, we actually increased substantially the roof insulation, so it was well above what the building regs required. We increase the thermal mass of all the walls and thicker walls and insulation. And if you look at those dormers, you can see a bit of overhanging on the dormer windows, and that just provides that extra bit of shading. And between the windows, there are these nighttime levers, which allows us to purge ventilation um, into those rooms. The size of the windows all overall and the facades were actually narrowed also to avoid solar gain in the summer. And you can see here, this is where all the residents of extra care apartments, they can walk across to the folk home. 
um, for the lunch. Um, I would just gather for a chat underneath it on a warm day. And then finally, you can see here the children's play space. And that was really important that that was upgraded. Uh, this is an unusual photograph to see it like this, because normally it is actually full of children. Most days you will see the kids on the way back from school or during the holidays uh, congregating now. So it gives us real intergenerational drive behind the master plan. So finally, I'm just going to think a little bit beyond having, you know, it's set such a high bar for designers and clients, I would say. And I think it still remains incredibly relevant to what we do today. But I just wanted to reflect on a few other things that are, are coming um, from our sector. And I think the first thing is about changing aspirations. We are seeing there's two generations of older people now. People are living that much longer, but quantity is not always the same as quality. And I would say these to us are the real key ingredients that we see um, that are important in design terms to think about to make sure that older people that move into the developments are living not just long lives, but for full and happy lives. And health and well-being is absolutely central to that. So we're always thinking about how indoor, outdoor spaces work in harmony to make sure that people have active lives with a real sense of purpose. I would say that choice is something we, we need more. We need we need the volume, as Laura Bess has said, but we also need to think a little bit about um, the, the size of what we're building, the locations and the models. We are already seeing a huge um, diversity in those choices, but I think there's a long way to go. And we are a much more diverse community in the UK now, and that's starting to really feed, it, really feed into some of the designs and the projects, which is great to see. Affordability, affordability and viability, from the outset, is something we should always be designing to. And at the moment, our construction costs are a concern, but we need to always be thinking about operational costs and whole, whole life costings for the, the length of the building. I would say as designers for us, the big thing is um, communities. It's how people can be active in their communities and how we can connect with the wider community in design. We need to always be thinking about well-being and purpose, and it has to be at the heart of the design approach and reinforcing connections for family and friends and local communities for our residents is incredibly important. And I believe that that is the way that they will live full and happy lives in the new years. Thank you. Jenny, thanks ever so. That was really great. And uh, both to look at sort of over the you know, 15 years, and especially since 2010 and the happy awards that uh, Richard referred to led by David Birkbeck and Design for Home. So if people aren't aware of that uh, program, do have a look at his website. He has a great catalogue of uh, age friendly and happy designed homes on, on their website. Um, Patrick, I know you know David well as well, but uh, you're going to reflect on your work um, with uh, Happy and you were there at the outset too. So delighted that you could join us and to give us your insights. I'm not sure if that's uh, Jenny coming off shared screen or whether that's Patrick looking for your slides. You'll be able to see that. No, we've got it. We've got somebody's screen. Um, I think, um, Jenny, oh. you're still screen sharing. Uh, there should be a button at the top. Here we are. Yeah, yep. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Patrick, the floor is you yours. See, you see a nice looking building. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Excellent. That's us. Jenny, thank you so much. That was really interesting um, and inspirational. Um, I call this future of place. Um, I've been out and about telling people that, uh, as Richard said, um, design for later life is leading the uh, leading the charge uh, when it comes to design quality. Um, it may seem an extravagant claim, but I think we, we are able to show that there's a good deal of substance to it. Um, three aspects that we'd like to focus on, all of them um, revolve around this um, contention that older people belong at the centre of life, not at the edge. Um, and that fits well with some of the things Jenny was saying as well. So the three things we just like to quickly cycle through. One, this idea that later living is leading residential design in the UK and elsewhere. Um, it's among the best residential development currently being built. Secondly, IRCs, uh, Richard mentioned in passing, um, we'll talk about integrated retirement communities and the integration bit of that is really crucial. Um, these communities should benefit not only old people, but all generations um, in the middle of the neighborhood and community in which they live. And finally, um, just a little think about how the market might be developing in terms of build to rent, uh, what um, Bidwell's for instance are calling operational living, uh, which is beyond the model of uh, selling 
and moving on, it's having um, a lifetime interest in the building as a developer operator, and possibly some things that built to rent might be able to learn from Happy. So the first is residential design, surely um, all about sterling prize winners and grand designs um, and Happy Award winners, um, up to a point. But we think that design for later living emphasizes the social aspect of architecture, as well as really important well-being characteristics. And the discussion and adoption of these principles by enlightened clients and planners can be traced back to our inescapable first happy report. I was tempted to reminisce for 10 minutes with anecdotes um, about the first happy report, but um, entertaining possibly, but not so informative. Um, what I wanted to pick out was not to, to rehash what, what Jenny um, so interestingly talked about, but just to pull in a nutshell, the, the principles are not tick boxes, they're best practice principles, um, something that we, we find ourselves explaining to planners some, uh, from time to time. They focus on space, focus on natural light and ventilation, and they focus on sociability. Um, we know from research, and if I could give the Housing Lens website a little plug here for the excellent quality of the research that you can find there, free to all, access to high quality, i.e. Day, glare-free daylight, is a huge positive and necessity for older people. And conversely, isolation is a massive negative. Going along with those, energy sustainability is particularly important because of the amount of time older people spend at home and because we become increasingly vulnerable to cold and overheating as we age. Now, significant parts of this best practice from the Happy Report um, began to feature in London Mayor's Housing Design Guide from 2012 on the left there, dual aspect homes, for example, becoming increasingly important in subsequent revision. And where the London Housing Design Guides have led um, enlightened other authorities, Cambridge, Oxford, Bristol and others um, have followed. And there is an increasing demand and knowledge we find from local planning authorities about high quality design. And I'm um, provocatively tracing a lot of this back to the happy report and the cultural change in our sector that it led to. The, I'm probably leaving my slides on there. So this is Colby Lodge in London, um, developed for Walthamstow and Chingford Arms House Charity. I put this up um, because it brings together sustainability and sociability principles um, that are at the heart of happy, and as I say, increasingly um, at the heart of design guidance. It encapsulates many of the principles of the 2016 London Housing SPG, so cross-ventilation, 100% dual aspect flats, and it makes its access deck to the rear, this is the street view, into a sociable space, which provides solar shading and of course, cross ventilation, fresh air to all the flats, passive means of temperature control. Um, and Sibsi went up there in the first of the current run of heat waves and talked to cool older residents in all senses um, about uh, how housing, housing might be designed in the future. There's not a huge amount of guidance around for this. Um, and we, as a result, uh, looked at doing um, a bit of uh, research and development uh, and putting out Deck Access Housing Design Guide featuring Colby on the cover, available in all good bookshops. And then more recently, Shading for Housing. The climate is changing, we all know. Uh, it's something we're simply not used to dealing with in this country. So the sun shading industry and various sponsors as you can see there came together um, and you can download that from the Good Homes Alliance website. So the theme of um, sociability and energy sustainability coming together. Um, in order to invite the neighborhood in, promote good links between um, residents and the neighborhood around them, we need to have a building which is inviting. Um, and we use this uh, as an example of that, that view on the street through to the gardens at the back. But at the same time, um, people need to feel secure and private in their homes. A common um, concept in later living is that of progressive privacy. And this is something that could be uh, well adopted by the rest of the sector. Um, the success of the shared spaces in a scheme like this um, really does depend um, on uh, the security of residents in their own home, their ability to um, have the public come in, to have events while they remain are able to remain private. Um, and during the pandemic, this model proved its adaptability um, to changing circumstances where um, bubbles are able to exist in places like this really successfully um, while um, being safe and secure uh, in the wider world. 
IRCs, Integrated Retirement Communities. So um, ARCO, Association of Retirement Community Operators, has been conducting focus groups and market research for many years into how the public understand the later living sector. And the answer is they don't. And here from the Happy Report is why. All of these different terms um, for various kinds of care and support. When they did their focus groups um, and research, they found that care, support were negatively perceived, but retirement positively. And so integrated retirement community was chosen. Now, the integrated element of this is what I'm particularly interested in because it means something is going to put people at the center of life, not at the edge, because they're integrated with the world around them while having their accessible, low energy, um, sociable, well day lit homes. Um, and we have a couple of examples uh, that we can use to illustrate this. One's a town extension and the other is a, a brownfield site in London. And they also show something Jenny touched on, different ways of promoting multi-generational living. Um, multi-generational living is, of course, um, a well-functioning neighbourhood, village, town, where people mix in the social space of the streets. Um, the first example um, with Anchor here in Bath, it's Pemberley Place. This was... Um, with me, lost my place. Uh, 72 extra care flats, courtyard garden and a new cafe. And in fact, it's the section 106 development. So this is all affordable um, for a um, Blin Bloor Linden 300 plus home um, family housing development, all of which is private. Now, Anchor understood straight away that from the position um, of uh, their site next to the entrance to the main site and on the way to a new primary school, which is in the hatched area top left, um, that their development could become the social centre of the surrounding residential scheme. So the primary school has parents dropping off every day and they um, will come and use the cafe and the sheltered courtyard garden. Those of you who know Bath will know that um, this area to the north of Bath is a windy plateau. Giving people a sheltered garden is going to be very attractive. Not only that, there's also a meeting room um, and combination of facilities, the location and the design, the invitation to the neighbourhood uh, is starting to make Pemberley the, the social hub of this um, new development. It's only opened earlier this year, um, about I think a third full so far. So we're looking forward to going back um, and seeing how it's working. Already um, staff there are developing links to the primary school and multi-generational um, opportunities for the children to come in and garden, um, the uh, residents to go and participate in learning and classes. Uh, and we think this is gonna be a real uh, exemplar um, of how new development can benefit from uh, IRCs, integrated later living communities as part of the multi-generational offer and part of its social sustainability. Uh, the other one goes back a little further, Woodside Square in Muswell Hill. Um, it has reintegrated what was once an inaccessible hospital site into the fabric of Muswell Hill. You can see through the middle there a north-south route goes from um, Grand Avenue and Muswell Hill through to Highgate Woods, very well used. Um, and the scheme itself in the little various colors you can see there includes affordable family housing, mid-market and very expensive family housing, which help cross subsidize the scheme, heritage buildings listed, locally listed, which have been made accessible um, and converted for residential use. And then a little family of apartment blocks in the center of the scheme, which have all tenures in them um, and are restricted to the over 55s. The um, social space um, in the development is, I'll show you some of the different type, uh, apartment types here. So here are the over 55 apartment blocks um, in the same language as the uh, expensive family houses and, and more affordable family houses um, and garden allotment space integrated um, with the development. So the landscaping in this development is the main social space of the development as it would be um, in a village or a lively quarter of a town or city. Um, most of the um, private and shared ownership purchasers who've moved in are from the local area. So they are maintaining their social networks, freeing up local family housing, and the development is fully integrated with its neighborhood and embedded later living development, which um, as with Jenny schemes does not look like uh, it is for older people. So both of these schemes demonstrate an invitation to the wider world combined with privacy and security for residents. 
The invitation is a precondition for the active social life that we know is so important to all of us, and the pandemic made it clear it's not just important to old people. And the location at the middle of a new or existing neighbourhood, well-connected, is what makes that social life possible. A little excursion into what later living might have to learn from Bill to Rent and vice versa. Um, this is a Bill to Rent scheme of ours in um, Hanslow, not for older people specifically, but having a lot of older residents. Uh, Bill to Rent um, as a... Um, a sector is really well established in the US and it's becoming more common here. Um, Grey Star, Apache, Granger, well established, and, and with several others. What Later Living can learn from this market is how to operate a long term investment model um, rather than um, selling uh, and having a management company uh, and moving on. So, capital investment is an important part of the build to rent model, but crucially, quality design and construction will pay off in longer refurbishment cycles and in an asset that retains its value. Uh, we know ARCO are heavily involved in uh, the discussions about leasehold reform at the moment going through Parliament. But I put this chart up because um, you don't get all pretty pictures, just to show something that is setting out at the beginning of a project, capital cost of servicing, different kinds of heating, um, carbon emissions, compliance, the maintenance regime, how easy it is to operate for residents, the running cost per apartment and the payback period, okay? And this enables the client, the operator, to make an informed decision about what is gonna be best for the lifetime of the building, what the payback and recycle um, and refurbishment cycles are. So their interests are then well aligned with ESG goals, um, including energy sustainability. They, both operator and residents, benefit from lower operating costs while maintaining the value of the asset. ESG is a big thing for investors, and we've, we, we, we increasingly see that um, with clients talking that language and needing to talk that language to attract the big um, investments into their um, developments and what they want to do. Um, energy is important. The social part of ESG um, is also absolutely um, crucial in this sector. We're providing a service which is socially critical, um, and, it, and it is easy to demonstrate that. Um, Later living providers looking at a rental model um, rather than um, more traditional models, possibly including shared ownership, um, have been encouraged by um, research showing that uh, service charges in themselves are not necessarily as sensitive as we might think, provided that they are transparent. So older renters, whether in IRCs, co-living projects, build to rent, can distribute the balance of the tax-free capital receipt from their family home to children and grandchildren after purchasing an annuity or another instrument that covers their rent and service charges. And it massively simplifies um, their uh, financial arrangements, inheritance arrangements uh, at the end of life. What Bill to Rent might be able to learn um, from later living schemes is how to integrate more with their neighborhood. And while of course providing privacy and security to their residents. And I, I don't apologize for going on about this. This might develop then the US model, which tends whether urban or suburban to be quite monolithic the UK housing market is evidently shifting in many areas from the traditional first job, first mortgage aspiration, partly because um, that is financially impossible for lots of people. And later living by freeing up homes, and maybe some cash, has a potentially positive role to play in this. Aside from that, I hope I've started to show that good later living design is a crucial component in good places. Thank you. Patrick, uh, great, great presentation to follow on from Jenny's. And uh, in fact, a lot of the things you raised there are, are highly relevant also for uh, my colleagues on the task force who are also looking at future viability. And uh, the chair of ARCO, Nick Sanderson, is, is, is a critical partner of ours on that task force. So Thank thanks you. very much for drawing attention to, to those. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to a couple of questions. Uh, can I just remind people to, to post any questions that they, they have for the panel uh, in the Q&A box? Uh, I seem to have lost a few as well. So if you issued and put up some uh, earlier, please repost them, or cut and paste them and retype or retype them back in. I apologize uh, at my end, it seems uh, there's been a slight malfunction. Um, but we'll come back to those questions after we've heard fr from Gary. So Gary, I 
great to see you. And again, thanks ever so to Churchill for your support, but also I know you've been in this sector for some years and been really keen to think about build quality in a number of ways, but also from a planning perspective. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Okay, thank you. So my, my, my presentation takes a slightly different angle, really. So I, I focus a little bit more on some of the other great findings and recommendations that flowed from Happy One and through to Happy Happy Two and Two and Three. So a little bit more focus on planning, planning, I guess, um, rather than on the design. And there's probably not a lot more I could say about design following those two great presentations that we've just had. So I'm relying on Sally to turn my slides. So if you could turn my first slide, Sally, please. Um, so a little bit about Churchill Retirement Living for those who don't know the company. Um, we build retirement living accommodation. So um, supportive housing rather than extra care housing or IRC schemes um, consisting of apartments and cottages primarily. And we only have a for sale model. We don't uh, rent or part rent, part buy. And we have a very simple, clearly defined business, which is aimed at a middle market. So a key thing for us from a design perspective and everything else that we do is trying to make sure that we produce a product that's affordable for our, for our customer. So most of our customers come from a three bedroom terraced or semi-detached property so it's it's obviously the initial purchase price is one thing that's really important but also the ongoing service charge typically we would develop 40 to 50 units on on a, on a site all of our sites are centrally located urban brownfield land um, and our typical customers i've mentioned in my slide there is an 80, 81 year old predominantly single single female we've built over sixteen thousand apartments some 400 schemes and we now manage uh, we didn't initially manage our own developments but now we have Churchill estate management and we manage over 200 developments more than 8,500 apartments so we do everything in-house we have an in internal land buying um, or land buyers we have five regional offices throughout the UK they all have a land buying team they all have their own internal architects we have an internal planning team. We subcontract most of the construction, but we manage it ourselves. We have our own site managers, and then we conduct all of our sales and management. And then we have Churchill Sales and Letting, which deals with resales and relets. And we're quite proud of our of our reputation. This year, only only last month, in fact, we we were awarded the best retirement home developer. 2023 at the Watt House Awards, which is the Oscars really for the house building industry. We turn the slide, um, you'll see just a few examples there. Because of the nature of the sites that we develop, we're pretty well experienced with dealing with different townscape contexts. Uh, we produce some traditional schemes and some more contemporary schemes. Uh, we're building conservation areas next to listed buildings. We have sites that are heavily contaminated, which we have to deal with. Uh, we have sites that have archaeological interests as well. Some of our sites are suburban. Some of them are in new developments sitting next to um, a new neighbourhood centre and others are more city centre located. So quite a diverse um, experience of, of dealing with different constraints and opportunities presented by various sites. Next slide, please. So the happy reports did a lot of things for me, um, all the reports, but the first few really, the first thing that they did was really highlight the needs for us to deliver genuine housing choice, choices for our aging population. Um, and in promoting that genuine choice, I think the one thing that happy has always done is said that there's no single solution. Uh, there's all types of different housing that we should be delivering to meet the differing needs and aspirations of older people. Uh, ordinary retirement living of the type that we do, extra care housing or IRCs, villages, um, bungalows are a great form of housing as well. It's just a pity that planning policy doesn't help deliver bungalows given the low density of development and the constraints that we have on, on, on land values. Um, and different, different tenures, as I've mentioned before, so outright sale, shared ownerships, shared equity and, for, and full rental and different levels of affordability, you can have discount market sale and discount market rent. Um, so great thing that I think Happy has done over the years, but certainly initially was just to, to make it very clear that we need to do something. Richard said earlier in opening that one of the 
one of the sad things really is that it's that's not really moved forward and i come back to that later in my presentations because i still think there's a, a lot more that we can do despite all of the great things that uh, happy happy has high, highlighted um, and that includes actually the health i should have mentioned the health and social care benefits and social and eco economic benefits that providing better housing solutions for older people brings to to society in general but also to local communities we turn to the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this is, I've, I've got a different extract from Happy One. Um, and mine's the scheme called Neptune, Neptune in Malmo in Sweden. And when I went on the happy tour of all the, when I went on the tour of all the ha Happy One schemes, I was particularly struck by this one, probably mainly because I'm a planner, but the design was fantastic. It was a great product had some great facilities within the scheme, but most impressive for me was the fact that this was a local authority that had actually allocated one of its best development sites in the centre of town, the centre of Melmo, uh, for a form of housing for older people. And that's something that you rarely, if ever, see happen uh, in, in this country. And I'll come, come back to that point a bit later on. Next slide, please. These were the two very important um, happy reports. I worked on one of these, helped, helped um, Richard and his, and, uh, and his uh, panel that he put up, put together to, to come forward with such, such, some of these. And they, they focused on, on the barriers and, and the opportunities and they made some great recommendations for, from cha for change. Um, one of the significant barriers, and again, because I'm a town planner, this is close to my heart, but, but is planning. I'll come back to that later, but there's very little proactive planning for um, specialist housing for older people in the country at the moment, but I'm hoping that will change soon. Uh, the reports mentioned, uh, picked up on the fact that there's little fiscal or other incentives to help increase supply and encourage new entrants in, into, into this sector. Um, it talked about possibility of stamp duty exemptions and an alternative to help to buy, which I think now we would call probably help, help to right size. And significantly, Happy Two actually recommended a cabinet office task force. I think there are others out there at the moment that are, that are claiming um, cla claiming that they, they were the first to encourage the government to set up a task force, which we now have, of course, which I'm assuming most people listening in to today will be, be aware of. I'll refer to that again a bit later on. But I would say thank you to Richard and thank you to Happy for it's taken us a long time to get there but at least we are there now and fingers crossed that we can have something good that comes from it next slide for me please so 10 years on and this is richard's point really despite all the great things design has moved, design has been one success i mean that's worked really really well but in terms of supply i'm saying you know not much has changed perhaps little changes is, 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 is a bit unfair but not a lot has changed. Um, and when you reflect on some of those barriers and opportunities that were picked out in the earlier happy reports, um, planning was, had, was and still is a, a, a real difficult one. I feel for planning authorities at the moment because there are significant resource issues, but that's an issue that's, that's a problem for everybody. But I think it's just a lack of um, an appreciation of what retirement housing actually is about. Um, it's a lack of um, appreciation of the social and economic benefits that flow from this type of housing and balancing those against other planning considerations. As I said before, we rarely, we don't really have any proactive planning in this country. We still have the misconception, mainly amongst planning committees, I have to say, not officers, that if you come forward with a proposal for a specialist housing scheme for older people, they think that that's going to result in a huge inward migration of older people that's going to exert extra pressure on local health and social care services. But that's not the case because the vast majority, or certainly in our case, the vast majority of our uh, purchasers already live in that area. They come from the local area. And in fact, when they do move in, their sense of well-being improves and their health improved, improves. And it's quite the opposite to that fear amongst some local people and committee members. Um, I've mentioned the fact that there's very little incentive for new entrants into this marketplace. It's, it's a risk business. It's a business that if, certainly if you're going to manage your own schemes, it, it needs uh, specialist expertise 
Um, but there's not a lot that's happening at the moment that that would help the likes, you know, what, what would encourage Taylor Wimpy and Barrett, for example, to come into this space? And how can you help small startup business or smaller SMEs um, to develop? Because there are huge costs and risks involved in in um, delivering this type this type of type of type of housing. But anyway, the good news is, as I said before, we now have a government task force on older people's housing, and that's a photograph of Julia Mayers, who's Professor Julia Mayers, who's who's leading it. Uh, Richard's involved in it. I know that. Um, Jeremy's involved in it. I'm indirectly involved through the Retirement Housing Group. Arco are involved in it. So, um, and I believe that it's approaching some initial interim recommendations. And I think it's a great, a great opportunity for us to move forward and address some of these issues. Um, and as I've said there, in my view, that's largely th thanks to Happy because Happy was the one that first recommended we do something in this direction. Next. Just next slide, please. So from the developer's perspective, um, I've put a few points down here. So I've said that consented land is the, is the lifeblood of our business. Well, actually, if you think about it, consented land is the lifeblood of any development company, because if we don't buy land to get planning consent, it's not rocket science. We've got nothing to build, nothing to sell, and nothing to manage. So it's really important. And it's also important to recognize that land and planning are intrinsically linked. There's no point in buying land unless you're going to get planning permission. That means that developers like my company have to assess the planning risk before we can commit to acquire a site. And there's a lot of competition for the sorts of sites that we develop. We're not always in competition with other house builders because our sites are very centrally located within or adjacent to shopping centres. And there often is commercial interest, either an existing viable commercial use or other non-residential users that would like to buy that site too. Um, but what's important is that we don't just go and buy any site and think we're only gonna buy a site if it can get us planning consent, because first of all, that site needs to meet our customers' needs and aspirations. It's got to be a site where we think our customers will be happy to live there. So I've mentioned established community is a really important thing for us. Accessibility to shops and services and public transport is really important, as is an interesting aspect. But this one's quite critical from a viability perspective, three, three stories or more. Now, that's not necessarily from a development viability perspective, but we need a level of development that's going to ensure that we can get a volume of apartments in there that keeps the service charge down and affordable to our particular customer. <coughs> And then when we come to design, um, one of the main drivers for us is that we obviously want a quality design and quality finish in our, in our, in our developments, but we've got to make sure that those partners are saleable to our customers so that we, the design layout and specification is going to meet their, their uh, desires and, more, and importantly, that it's going to be affordable to them. It needs to be a scheme that's buildable. It needs to be cost effective and viable, both from the development perspective, but also from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the customer's perspective. And I'll put down there the phrase mother, mother value. We have a thing within the company here where we apply a mother value concept. So everything that we do when, when we're looking at a site, when our architects are designing the scheme, when we're negotiating our planning consents and thinking, should we concede on this point or that point? Excuse me a second. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, when we're pricing the development, everything we're thinking about here is, is would, would my mother be happy living on this site, living in this scheme? Could Would this be a sustainable development for her? Would it meet with her needs and her expectations? And I think that's a a principle which is really important. And, and actually, in that context, it's not just the older person. Obviously, it's the older person when we're thinking mother value, but when we're thinking about our customer or consumer, we're thinking about our customers being the older person, but also their family, their dependents. Uh, we do an awful lot of research with our uh, customers, both both the um, older people that we sell to and their, and their dependents. And we do a lot of non-purchaser a lot of non-purchaser research as well. And that, that will help us inform our designs. Um, designs in terms of, I said before, the, the, the composition of the scheme, the facilities that we put into the scheme that our customers 
uh, 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 needs or wants, um, and then also the specification. And our research over the years is, is, has been very similar to that undertaken by Arco and other others. And things like, excuse me, balconies and storage space, kitchen and bathroom specifications is, is things that have developed over time and will continue to develop as we have a changing, changing customer um, characteristic as we move forward. Next slide, please. So still a long way to go. And from a planning perspective, I've mentioned my view that we need a more proactive or positive um, planning regime or approach to uh, housing for older people. Uh, and I'll say there, I think what we ideally what we want is a planning and housing policy presumption in favour. Uh, we rarely see sites allocated for development. We rarely see a section 106 being applied to a larger uh, housing scheme, strategic housing scheme, or development briefs attaching to those housing developments that that require a, a proportion of housing that's suitable for older people, whether that's the type of housing we develop or others develop specialist housing or even bungalows. It, 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 we very, very rarely see that. Um, and then just generally positive policies that help bring this forward. So we will often clash with policies that are seeking to protect existing employment uses. And whilst we obviously, um, I obviously respect the merits of those policies and the reason justification for them, sometimes one has to take the view, well, is it better to retain that use, uh, which may or may not have a, a, a good long-term future in that use, or would it be better to allow that site be developed for retirement housing? So in one form or another, which brings with it the sort of social and economic benefits to local communities that I mentioned before. We tend to find that we get a much more balanced view of our proposals regretfully when we take them through the appeal process. That's not, um, I'm not accusing planning officers of not doing that, but sometimes for the reasons I mentioned before, uh, we do find that planning committees are a little blinkered and their priority focus will be on the delivery of housing at the other end of the housing ladder, i.e. affordable housing. We need proper, robust housing needs assessments. Uh, the retirement housing group, which we're a member of, and others are calling for a minimum of 10% of all new housing to be specialist housing for older, older people. So 10% of the 300,000 target or target that was in existence. We're not quite sure whether that's going to be carried forward in the new MPPF when that comes out this week. Um, it equates to 30,000 units per annum, which is quite a challenge, but it, there's been a lot of independent research that, that, that suggests that that's, that's about the level of uh, supply that we really need if we're going to deliver genuine good housing choice for our ageing population. And 10% of Homes England's and GLA funding should be for housing for older people in, in, a, in our view. A lot of these recommendations are ones that have been talked about before. Some of them are in, in the original happy reports, as I've mentioned, and, and most of these are going forward into the task force. So for me, it's fingers crossed that something comes out of the task force to help finally deliver on some of those great recommendations that first were muted in, in the happy reports. Turn the page. So I think um, we're getting there slowly. Uh, it is fingers crossed that the task force will result in a meaningful and beneficial impact on supply. Still a long way to go, but as I say, there, repeating myself again, thank goodness that Happy kick-started the focus on the housing needs and aspirations of our aging population back in 2009, because I'm not sure that we'd even be where we are now without Happy. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Gary, thanks ever so, and uh, I'm sure none of us want to see another 15 years pass with only small incremental uh, changes uh, taking place. I'm conscious we're, we're rapidly running out of time. We've got a, a dozen or so questions, both in the Q&A box um, and, and, and one or two in the chat box. Um, let me just quickly do do some of the ones from the um, from the uh, from the Q and A box. Uh, firstly, there was an issue about um, I think Jane raised it um, around engaging and involving with, with the customers. Gary, you've talked about it. Jenny, you've talked about Patrick. Is this principle of co-design embedded in in Happy Patrick? Can I come to you first? 
we saw a lot of schemes that were um, had an element of that going around uh, the European schemes in particular. Um, we uh, new ground was mentioned in another question, um, and that was uh, mm. co-designed. And we use a lot of the learning from that in other schemes, and other clients go and look at it and talk to the women and um, uh, can find out what they do like about it, what works and what doesn't. I think there could be more, um, much more. Uh, people are unreasonably afraid of it because of cost, but it carries huge authenticity for planners, apart from anything else, and for understanding what residents really want. So um, I think that could increase. Yeah. And Jenny, so a supplementary question was about layers of privacy, and has that changed since the pandemic? And I know PRP, you wrote a very influential guide on pandemic and later living. Any, any thoughts around that? I think that <clears throat> I'll always go back to what Patrick was saying. Um, the private sector has a lot to learn from the retirement sector and way we design spaces. So we've always designed projects, I would say all architects in this field, with layers of privacy, um, making sure the public realm is for the public, making sure the garden spaces are semi-private or private, they're shared. Um, but as you move through the buildings, you know, we, we do put those layers of security in. And what we did find from, uh, during the pandemic is we went back and asked our clients, is it working, is it not working? We found that the later living projects across the board were generally working really well because they could control comings and goings out of buildings as well as protecting those residents and keeping them happy and not so isolated as it would have been in the community. So I think it actually does work really well already. There's been a question about sort of um, accommodating cars and bicycles and the like, Gary. Any any thoughts about that and the links to, to transport on sites? I think um, accommodating cars and bicycles is is one that goes back to your first question, which is, you know, understanding what your customer requir requirements are. Uh, we talk about housing for older people or older people as being a sort of 55 plus or 60 plus age group. Uh, I said in my presentation, uh, to the typical customer that we're providing for is an 80, 81 year old widow. So, um, it, you know, you need to understand who you're trying, who you're trying to accommodate and what, what their, what their requirements will, will be. In our case, uh, we, we find that we don't have a large proportion of car, car owners. Uh, very few, very few of our, our owners uh, actually cycle, cycle because of their, their age and of course they age in their development as, as well while they're there. Um, so um, we don't provide 100% car parking, but that's not to say that the other other schemes that are targeted at perhaps a more active or, and or aff, affluent um, older person would 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 be looking to do something else. So it's it's all about understanding who who you're providing that accommodation for. There's several interesting comments. Ian raises issues about planning and the Mayhew review about an aspiration of fifty thousand homes. Um, Richard, any thoughts about that in terms of, you know, IRC in every town? Muted. Muted there. Um, no, absolutely. Um, Mayhew said 50,000. One of our reports, two of our reports, in fact, said between 30 and 35,000 homes a year. There's a, a, enough of a market for that for that sort of proportion. But we're doing seven to 8,000. It's pathetic. Um, it's pathetic in the social sector and it's pathetic in the private sector. We, 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 we've got to do better. Gary's point about planning is absolutely key. If sites were allocated exclusively for this purpose, that's what's going to happen to those sites. If house builders with major developments were told, well, 10% has got to be for older people's housing, just as we talk about the proportion for affordable housing, then we get more of it. And there's a chicken and egg thing. At the moment, people are very reluctant to think, you know, they're 81 before they move into your schemes, Gary. Um, they're very reluctant to think about moving at 55, like all those people in Europe. <laughs> and 65 is, is quite old to be moving to, to, right, to right size, but far more would if there's far more opportunities and they see more of these lovely schemes around. So getting that supply up is, is re really crucial. Thanks, Richard. Just a few little things then. I know Philippa raised the question about what was the second example that you gave, Patrick? I think it was the Walthamstow Arms House, but uh, we're going to share the slides unless you can quickly say if it wasn't. 
Unless it was Woodside Square in Muswell Hill. Maybe um, Woodside yeah. Square, right. So, but the slides will be circulated. Jenny, there's an interesting question from somebody who remains anonymous uh, about issues around dual aspect. I don't know if you've seen that and about, you know, what does that impact on affordability or viability? Bit of a tricky one, but any thoughts? I think it can be. Um, I think, uh, you know, the idea of using gallery access is one way of, of I'm not sure your apartments can be dual aspect really good, but it doesn't actually work on every site. And there are certain things you need to think about, like it's not particularly good if your gallery access is onto an open road because it compromises security. It's better if it's onto a garden and it becomes a more sociable space. Um, we are looking more, we are being pushed more and more to look at dual aspect. It's the absolutely the right thing to do because of what's happening in our climate and dual aspect flats, you know, are, are the the real thing, the real thing that we're trying to achieve where we can. But I do appreciate it's not always possible and it can affect viability if it's not thought through carefully. Thanks. And there's been some interesting conversation. You know, Janet, lovely to have you with us this afternoon talking about intergenerational, multi-generational. And Zoe, who, who's written a case study for the excellent work in Manchester, but she talks about a blended approach. And Richard, I was just wondering whether I could pass this one to you, because as a former chief exec of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, in effect, you had a blended approach with a retirement community at New Ears with, with, a, with, a, with a residential care facility. Do you think that close care facility approach works? Absolutely. That that was Hartrick Oaks, the first Hartrick one. Oaks, yes. Yeah, uh, t terrific scheme and integrated into the community around because people mix with each other. You don't have to live next door. You can have a development, but the development is within a community and is part of a community and people mix and you get that intergenerational exchange. Lots of elderly people from Hartrick Oaks do teaching therapy, helping the kids in the school. They're very much part of the fabric of making things happen in the village and in, in the surrounding area. So absolutely integrated retirement community, but integrated into the community around as well as amongst itself. And I'm just going to say one other question from Sue, uh, and this is probably for Gary. Um, she's asked about, you know, any thoughts about um, what happens around Section 106 or whether you think about Churchill entering into the affordable housing market even. Um, so just an interesting question she poses there. Yeah, um, well, answer the second point to begin with. At the moment, we've no intention of uh, entering into the affordable housing market we're focusing on our mid-market model as I, as I said said before um, in terms of section 106 I mean viability is a is a massive massive issue um, and um, my personal view well it's not it's not just my personal view there are others now that subscribe to this view I think uh, there's a case to say that there should be a, a, health, a health and social care cost credit um, given to retirement housing schemes when one thinks of all the benefits that, that arise from it, not least being the saving on the public purse in, in terms of housing social care costs. And maybe, maybe that means that, um, you know, there could be a case for full exemption from affordable housing and SIL and some other Section 106 costs in recognition of those benefits that come forward because... At the moment, because we don't compete on a level playing field at the point of land acquisition, we're, deep, we're competing with other non-residential interests in the site, uh, we and others lose an awful lot of development opportunities because of those, those cost burdens. You know, We might be able to account for them within our schemes and make a contribution, but we find that others don't have to make that contribution and they outbid us. Um, so that would be my comment on that. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass over to Richard for, for some final few words and closing thoughts before I sort of uh, bring this year's Happy Hour series to a close. So, Richard. Well, thank you to everybody. I, I mean, the, the architectural profession has, has risen to this challenge. And PRP with, with, with Jenny, that wonderful scheme at uh, New Lodge that we were seeing there, uh, the Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust has done. Patrick's done some fantastic schemes with, with PPE. Uh, we, we mustn't forget Julia Park's contribution from Levitt Bernstein as well. We've had some great architects. They've shown the way. They're, they're showing the way to the whole of the residential sector and, uh, and good on all of them. And Gary uh, is, is championing the need for, for more, for supply, which is really important. I think the, the last um, report that came out of the Happy Stable, that's under our umbrella of the all-party parliamentary group on housing and care for older people. The last one that came out was on shared ownership. 
And I hope, Gary, even though you're not going to get into rented housing, you could think about the shared ownership for that uh, that middle range of people who can't can't afford the full price of a new flat of yours, but who could put in a proportion and pay a proportion in rent. And if you find, you know, the management you're already doing could cope with that, I'm sure. So the, the shared ownership does open up that really opens up a much bigger market than we have at the moment where we tend to be serving either the, the pretty rich or the social housing sector with some lovely extra care schemes. But in between, there are all those people for whom a shared ownership model may be an answer, as our last report said. And just to say that the the, the ongoing report that's coming out next year uh, from this same stable, and we'll have a happy, a happy stamp on it, uh, is on the regeneration of outdated sheltered housing, because we've now got an awful lot of stock, which we don't want to just lose and diminish the total supply for older people. We want to use those sites to create something new and better, improve what we've already got, convert and uh, sustainably make use of what we've already got. Uh, but uh, that's, a big, uh, that's a big challenge, and our report will have recommendations on that. Finally, yes, that task force, you, you know, I think we, we, we're finally getting there. Uh, Julianne Mayer, I'm seeing her one-to-one uh, -one on a regular basis. We, we meet again after cr Christmas, uh, and she's doing a great job, I know, with some wonderful people, including you, Jeremy. Gary, are you there as well? A, a, a number of key, of key players are already on board, and that report, I hope, will start a, a whole new way of, of thinking and doing things. So good luck to all of you involved, and many thanks for having us at this, uh, at this happy hour, Jeremy. Well, well, thank you for, for participating. And I also thank personally Patrick, Gary, and of course, Jenny, for, for your wonderful contributions this afternoon. Information about the session and the recording will be available uh, tomorrow. Um, this, as I said, is the last of the happy hours for the year. We kick off uh, as a one-off uh, on the 23rd of January. We'll be promoting that over Christmas, New Year, and then heavily early into the New Year, looking specifically around equality, diversity, inclusion, actually picking up one of the points that Patrick raised uh, and Jenny raised in, in, in their presentations. Uh, and then just heads up, uh, we're also just planning for our annual summit, which will take place on the week of the 26th of February. So watch out for more details, and uh, we look forward to uh, promoting that and inviting you to join us again for that session. Uh, there will be 10 sessions over the week. So uh, something to look forward to uh, in early 2024. But with that, can I thank the team behind the scenes for putting today's happy hour on our, our guest speakers. Everybody's raised those brilliant questions. And can I wish you season's greetings and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you next time. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas.